Good afternoon and welcome to the April 27th edition of your, your fascinating American literature and English class. I hope you had a pleasant weekend. I hope that your Lord's Day was uplifting. And I hope you're ready for another week of, of remote learning and remote uh, writing and all of that sort of thing. Um, we are, are entering the final stretch of this course. Uh, just a few more weeks and you will be turning in your end of course essays. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Your first draft was due today, April 27th, by the end of the day. You should check your emails for my uh, return of your draft with comments. It should be done within a couple of days, so check that. Now then, a week from April the 27th on May 4th, that's Monday, your revised drafts will be due. Again, you need to check your email for any comments and reviews and suggestions I have and get to work. Um, let me throw out uh, uh, what might be a radical suggestion here. For some of you, there, there is no reason you can't check your email every day. And if you have something, look at it and see what it is. Um, that way, that will give you a little extra time to be working on the things that I send you. Your final essays are due May the 14th. That is two weeks from the day that this essay will be up for you to, to look at. May the 14th. Your final papers will be due. May 17th is the last day for you to turn in any work that you have not turned in, whether an assignment or for extra credit. If it's not turned in by 5 p.m. on May the 17th, I'm not going to grade it. So uh, turn it in by then. Uh, some of you have quite a bit of work that you have not turned in. You know who you are because I've communicated with you. Uh, get it done. Uh, saving everything until the very last and then turning in four or five or more uh, late assignments on May the 17th is not a good idea. It will put me in a bad mood. And I will be in that bad mood when I'm grading your work. So that's, that's not a good plan. Um, go on iGrade, look at the lesson logs, look at the assignments. If you have assignments that you have not turned in, you need to turn them in to me. Uh, so, uh, ju just a word to the wise there. Now, you will be getting back your first drafts and then your second drafts. And uh, I'm going to have comments and suggestions about them, uh, uh, and I want to talk about that a little bit. First of all, I will not be correcting spelling or punctuation. That's your job. But I will be marking off for bad spelling and bad punctuation. So use your spell checker. Use your uh, grammar feature on your word processor and use this. And make sure that your spelling and punctuation are correct. Don't, uh, 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 there's no reason for those things to be wrong, so don't have them wrong. Um, on the other hand, I do suspect that I will have comments and suggestions on how you can make your essays better, uh, at least better in my mind. Uh, and it's going to be hard for us to talk about that. So what we're doing is, is that uh, you'll remember when we did your, your research papers back in the fall, I had a session where you could come in, and, and many of you did, to my office and talk to me, and we could work on those things. Well, we're going to do that again. Uh, we will schedule, I will schedule personal sessions to help any of you who want me to with your papers. 
we will use either Zoom or Facebook Messenger. Uh, that will be your preference. We will not use FaceTime because uh, I only have FaceTime on my phone and I want a big screen. So it will be Zoom or Facebook Messenger. Now make notes about this. Number one, you must schedule this ahead of time. Don't think you're going to be able to call me and say, can you help me today? Uh, you have to schedule this ahead of time. Number two, you will have to have your paper with my comments ready for you to look at. Now, of course, I'm going to email it to you, so uh, you will have it there, but you won't be able perhaps to look at it and also talk to me on the computer. So if that's going to be an issue for you, make sure that you have it printed off. I will be available any weekday, that's Monday through Friday, between 4.30 p.m. and 6 p.m. Those are the times that I will be available. Uh, I will not be able to schedule more than one of these a day. So, uh, uh, and it's first come, first serve. So, uh, so pick out the day you want and get in touch with me before someone else gets it. If those times will not work for you, Communicate with me, and I will will find some other time that I can do it. Uh, but uh, check into that. You will need to email me to schedule a time. If you want to use Zoom, I will have to schedule the meeting, and then send you an invitation. Like we, well, you've done some Zoom classes. If you want to use Messenger. You'll need to send me a friend request on Facebook, but you will also need to email me so that I can accept your friend request and schedule the meeting. And don't everybody wait until the Friday before something is due on Monday to start work. When you get my email, check it that day. Make sure the copy and the comments came through. Now, I hope you're all working diligently, and I hope you all plan on continuing to work diligently. You, you've got about two weeks into the end stretch of this, and I know it's hard, but it's what you need to be doing. Uh, keep it up. Keep it up. Today's lecture is going to be pretty short uh, because uh, we're getting near to the end of, of some of these things, but there are a few more things that we need to talk about today. Um, the first one is is a little bit more about the moviegoer, and, and there are some things that I told you I'd, I'd tell you about as we got into it. You should have finished reading The Moviegoer by now. If you're not finished, shame on you, because you've had plenty of time. But you should be finished. And you should be confused. Uh, if you're not confused, you, you didn't pay much attention. So, what's going on? What was Percy trying to do with this novel? Uh, what it was about, you know? Uh, a lot of times we don't know that, and uh, that is particularly true with uh, uh, novels that, that are written from kind of an existential standpoint, like the moviegoer, because confusing you is, is part, of the, uh, uh, part of the fun for the novelist. Uh, but, but we have a little bit more from Percy on this book for a couple of reasons. Now, he was actually obliged to say something about this book on an occasion after it was published. Uh, every year, the uh, 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 American Publishers Association issues uh, two prizes. That they're called the National Book Award, one for fiction and one for nonfiction. Uh, and the way that competition works normally is that books get nominated and there's a committee that makes up what's called a short list 
of, of the books that get nominated, and those are sent to a panel of judges who are literary people, people in the publishing industry or authors or people of that sort, and uh, they read it, read the books, and then they vote and they, they give an award. Uh, well, in 1960, I guess it was, the year that the moviegoer was published, uh, it did not make a big splash in the publishing world, but what happened was that one of the uh, committee members, one of the judges who had been uh, uh, assigned the job of reading the nominated novels and choosing among them also read the moviegoer and then uh, sent it to the other judges and said, read this. And the committee gave the award to the moviegoer, uh, the National Book uh, Award, uh, even though it had not been nominated. There was, there was quite a discussion about that, but it, it became quite a deal. And so there was a party, a banquet, uh, where Walker Percy had to go to pick up his prize, and it was money, so of course he went. Um, and he was obliged to give a little speech about the book at that movie. And, and in it, he tells us a little bit of what he was, was trying to do. It, it was a relatively short speech, and you can probably find it online uh, and read it if you want to. Uh, but, but at the end of the book, uh, he says this, or at the end of the speech, at the end of the speech, he says this, in short, the book attempts a modest restatement of the Judeo-Christian notion that man is more than an organism in an environment, more than an integrated personality, more even than a mature and creative individual, as the phrase goes. He is a wayfarer and a pilgrim. I doubt that I succeeded, but I thank you for what you have done. So that's what Percy says he was doing with the novel, trying to restate the idea that human beings are something more as he puts it, than an organism in an environment. Uh, remember, remember Jack London, remember to build a fire, and the idea that the man is really no different than the dog, an animal in an environment, and his death is just something that happens, and it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, that's an idea, that, that is a thought that some people have and that London expressed. Uh, think about Gatsby, where, uh, where Fitzgerald suggests at the end that, that really all we are is, uh, is, is uh, creatures whose uh, actions and fate and the things we do are determined by our past. And that try as we might, we, we we struggle against the past, and as he puts it, we're, uh, we're born back by the tide, regardless of what we do. Well, Percy offers another idea of what we are. Uh, man is a wayfarer and a pilgrim, uh, someone who is on a search, uh, a person who is going somewhere, even if he doesn't, uh, doesn't know exactly where that is. Um, that's part of what Percy was trying to get at. Uh, Percy was also, uh, in addition to, to a novelist, he was, he was something of a literary critic. Uh, and he wrote quite a bit about uh, what goes into writing a novel and what makes a novel good or bad. You, some of you will remember that early on in our class, I asked the class whether you thought that there were any kind of objective standards that make a book or a poem or a story or anything of that nature good or not good or bad, uh, or whether it was all entirely subjective and just, you know, different strokes for different folks. 
Um, if you enjoy reading it, it's good. If it's uh, if you don't enjoy reading it, it's bad. And as as I recall, most of you seemed to think that was mostly a matter of subjective taste. Um, uh, I think Percy would suggest something slightly different, and what, and in fact, he did suggest something slightly different that I'll read to you in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, he would say, uh, and if it interests you at all, I would say, uh, a novelist or a short story writer or a poet's first job is to tell a good story and to tell it in a way that keeps the reader interested. There's no question about that, and if the novel or the story fails that test, then it fails. There's no question. If, if, if it bores you, if you don't care about it, uh, if you're not interested in it, then, then it fails. But perhaps there's something a little bit more. Uh, and here is, here is something that Percy had to say about that and about the business of novel writing, um, at least in, in his time in the, the very late 20th century, and I think into ours, um, uh, and, and so he said this, he says, uh, but what are we to make of a man who is committed in the most radical sense to the proposition that truth is attainable by science and that emotional gratification is attainable by interacting with one's environment and at the highest level by the enjoyment of art. It seems that everything else is settled for him, but something is wrong. He has settled everything except what it is to live as an individual. He still has to get through an ordinary Wednesday afternoon. Such a man is something like the young man Kierkegaard described, who was given the task of keeping busy all day and finished the task at noon. What does this man do with the rest of the day, the rest of his life? But my question and my discovery was this. If there is such a gap in the scientific view of the world, e.g. what it is to be an individual living in the United States in 1985, and if the scientist cannot address himself to this reality, who can? My discovery, of course, was that the novelist can, and most particularly the novelist. Oddly enough, it was the reading of two 19th century writers, Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky, who convinced me that only the writer, the existentialist philosopher, or the novelist can explore this gap with all the passion and seriousness an expectation of discovery of, say, an Einstein who had discovered that Newtonian physics no longer works. So Percy would tell us that for a novel to really be what it ought to be, what it should be, it not only needs to tell us a good story in a way that keeps our interest, but it needs to somehow address what it means to live as an individual in the time where the, where the author writes. Uh, not necessarily in the time of the novel, because of an historic novel, one with a setting at some time in the past, can, can uh, measure up and do fine and be good. But it has to address what it means to live to be an individual in the time and place that the author is writing. And, and that may mean different things to different people and in different times. It, it meant different things to our authors. Think about it. Think, think about the type of characters that have been presented to us. What, what would Hawthorne tell us that it means to be a human being, that it meant to be an individual living in, uh, in New England in the 1850s. Uh, uh, he spent a lot of time 
addressing that with with uh, Holgrove, Holgrave, whatever his name is, and and his Emersonian notions uh, versus Judge Pynchon and his ideas. Uh, Hawthorne presented that to us. Jack London had an answer to us. He said it doesn't mean anything. A man is no different than a dog, and his life has no more meaning. And that's an answer. Fitzgerald had an answer. Uh, it means to be ruled by the past. Uh, Percy offers us a different answer in the moviegoer. Uh, and that is uh, um, that, is that, uh, that uh, man is a pilgrim and a wayfarer. That it means, to be an individual means that you have to figure out what the significance of your life is in some way. And I think that's a fair statement. You, you have heard me mention before or say that, that you know, certain books are not worth reading. And, and I think that's what I mean when I say that. It doesn't mean that it may not tell a good story. Uh, what it means is it's just not worth reading uh, because it doesn't address these important questions. Well, that, that brings us to your current reading assignment and the last author we're going to look at. Your current reading assignment is a short story called Revelation. Uh, I have posted a link to it on uh, Lesson Log. Some of you I know have already read it because you've made reference to it in, uh, in your outlines, so I know you've already read it. Um, let's, let's talk about Flannery O'Connor for a few minutes. Uh, first of all, and, and you don't know this from the name, which is not the entire name, but O'Connor was a woman. Uh, her entire name was Mary Flannery O'Connor. Uh, she wrote as Flannery O'Connor because she thought uh, people would be less likely to take her seriously if they knew she was a woman. Uh, Flannery O'Connor. Um, she was born in Georgia, in, a, in, a, in rural Georgia, out in the country, sometime, um, I guess, in the, uh, around 1930, uh, late 1920s, I suppose, and died about 1964 or 65. Revelation was published in 1965, and it first appeared after she had died. Um, so she died relatively young, and she died of lupus. Uh, some of you may know what that is. Um, it is a, an autoimmune disease, which causes your body's immune system to attack your body. Uh, it is excruciatingly painful, and it eventually kills people. And uh, O'Connor suffered from it for 14 or 15 years. She was uh, considered, up to the time of her death, one of the leading American authors of her generation. Uh, I, I would say of the past hundred years, no doubt, uh, she is one of the top one or two. Uh, uh, her reputation has declined since her death. And that's, that's a fascinating thing to have happened because her death shortly preceded a, 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 a major shift in American fiction writing, uh, uh, kind of a, an earth-shattering shift in which uh, uh, the whole uh, women became predominant uh, and women authors have been predominant in the fiction writing and publishing world since more and more so since beginning shortly after O'Connor's death up until now. And so you would think that, that a very prominent woman writer uh, would, would have, have gained in reputation. She has not. And, and the reason she has not is hard to put your finger on. Uh, 
To some extent, she has been pigeonholed as what's called a Southern author, and uh, there was kind of a, a, uh, a subgenre of Southern fiction uh, through the 1930s and 40s and 50s and 60s. Uh, but I don't think that's the real reason. Um, I, I think the real reason is because the world, uh, the literary world, the artistic world, the, the mainstream culture is no longer able to tolerate O'Connor's message and is no longer able to tolerate the answer that she gave to Walker Percy's question. Uh, what does it mean to be an individual and to live as an individual? Uh, how do I live through my Wednesday afternoon? Um, the world is no longer, uh, or at least most of America, is no longer able to tolerate O'Connor's answers. Um, so that's that's a background of this. Now, now as a little bit more background. Uh, uh, O'Connor is, is probably the very last serious author to publish serious, critically acclaimed, good literature from an expressly and explicitly Christian point of view. Uh, now, now, that's going to shock some of you probably who've read this story, but I think you'll get at what I'm getting at. Um, now, again, as with Percy, the Christianity is, is uh, expressed in a way that's foreign to many of us. O'Connor was a militant Roman Catholic uh, and very vocal about it, uh, very vocal that... Uh, that not only was the Christian uh, proclamation of the world true, but that the Catholic uh, interpretation and understanding of it was the only correct understanding and interpretation. She was very, very vocal about that. So, with, with all of that uh, uh, said, let's talk a little bit about Revelation. I expect you to be offended by Mrs. Turpin. I do. Uh, O'Connor expected you to be offended by Mrs. Turpin. Uh, I hope you're offended by Mrs. Turpin. Uh, keep that in mind as you're reading. Um, there is a, a word that appears throughout the story uh, that we're not going to mention, use, or discuss. Uh, that's what's going to offend you. Pay attention to how that word is used, to when it's used and when it's not used. Uh, pay attention to that. One other thing, and then I'm going to be done for today's lecture, and y'all can get busy reading if you have not uh Find out what the ugly girl's name is. It's told to you. The ugly girl. Find out what her name is and then decide whether you think there is any significance to it. Uh, I want to know that. What, why does the ugly girl have the name she has, if there's a reason? Uh, think that through. Uh, we'll talk about it again more on Thursday. There is no reason for any of you not to finish this story by Thursday. Uh, it's not very long. So read it. If you hate it and are appalled, uh, email me and tell me. Uh, uh, and we'll discuss it more. We'll discuss why it's written the way it is. And we will discuss perhaps what point O'Connor was trying to get across with her story. Uh, like, like... Walker Percy, she, she talked a little bit about what she was trying to do. So we'll do that. Um, be writing. Uh, be looking for my comments about your essays. They'll come back to you. Uh, 
If you hate this story, if you think I'm a beast for making you read it, let me hear about it. I want to know. That's everything. Uh, enjoy your week, and we will speak again on Thursday, April the 30th. Good afternoon.